I take you to be my wedded husband. To be my wedded wife. To have and to hold. From this day forward. For better. For worse. For richer. For poorer. In sickness. And in health. To love. And to cherish. Till death do us part. Welcome to The Journey, and welcome to week one of a series about relationships. So if you didn't know that's what we were talking about, you're here now. And uh, we're glad you're here. Let me look into the camera and say big hello to our West Wilmington Church family. Newark, will you help me show some love to West Wilmington? And then, man, just want to say a big hello to our church family at Recovery Centers of America. We love you so much. Thank you for being a part of this. And uh, we are starting this brand new series. And if you're new to our church, February is often a time we kind of focus on relationships. Valentine's Day is coming up and some of us are hoping someone pops the question, you know. We don't even know who yet. We're just hoping over coffee and <laughs> afterward that somebody. <laughs> Others of us are questioning the yes we said uh, to someone. And we'll talk about that during this series. And, some of us are saying, hey, I'm just fine without a romantic relationship. Thank you very much. No interest. And that's cool. And, and, and then a lot of us, I think, are just trying to figure out how relationships are supposed to work. How are they actually supposed to, to work? And we're, that's what this series is all about. So as we kick it off, we're also kicking off, as you heard, our spring semester of J groups, which I'm very excited about. All kinds of groups for you to choose from. And, and J groups, journey groups are just small groups of people doing life throughout the week. It's another kind of relationships, not romantic relationships. Although over the years, we have had some single people who started the group single and then uh, found someone in a J group. No better place to find someone, although past results are no guarantee of future success. Our attorneys require us to say that, but, uh, but so there's that, but I really want to encourage you because I, I think this is so key that wherever you are in your spiritual journey to just do life with a few other people going the same direction you are, form some friendships, get connected in a group this week, and it, it can make such a big difference in your life. So as we start the series, Susie and I, my wife and I have been married 22 years. Yeah, and I know, like, that's hard to believe looking at me, but uh, we have, and we have, we have a gray marriage, but we have irre irreconcilable differences in one area of our otherwise blissful union, and that is football. So I, my loyalty lies with a certain team. I want to remain objective, so I won't say which one, but I, there's a certain, certain team that I'm, I'm loyal to, and unfortunately, my wife, I don't know why, I don't know what happened in her life, but she, she is uh, committed to roots for another team. And I won't mention which team, I wanna protect her safety, but um, <laughs> what that means is, now thankfully neither of our teams are featured in the big game today, so there's peace right now, but during the regular season, when our teams would play each other, there was a palpable tension in the Johnston home. You could feel it. That was not a good day to come over. You know, you could just feel this tension in the atmosphere. And if, it's, if it was an evening game, we just knew when we go to bed, we're probably just gonna go to sleep. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Like no victory dances in the end zone. <laughs> if you know what I mean. And if you don't, it's gonna be a long series. So <laughs> for the next few weeks, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about why it so often seems like we're playing for two different teams in a relationship, why we're facing off on opposing sides of the ball and, and what that's all about, why, how staying in love with somebody can feel like the, a fight, like the fight of our lives many times. Whatever our beliefs about God, so wherever you land with spiritual things, whatever you kind of think about church and, 
and all of this, we, we all face this, and to, to kick it all off, to start it off, there's a question so many of us can relate to, and that's this, why is there so much conflict in our relationships? Like, why, why is it? So if you're in a romantic relationship right now, if you're dating, engaged, married, you've probably asked this question. Why, why does it feel like we're playing on for two different teams? If you're not in a romantic relationship, if you're single or divorced, if you're looking or content with your current status, it's still an important question. Why has there been conflict in the relationships maybe that you've been in in the past or in the relationships you see friends and family members in? Like, where does it come from? Why is there so much conflict? And this might be the moment when some of us go, I don't know what's wrong with your relationship, but I don't have a lot of conflict in mine, which if that's you, that's great. I think what some of us might have without realizing it is unresolved conflict. So maybe we're not having it out. Maybe we're like, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Like everything's nice, smiley, but beneath the surface, there's some stuff, everybody. Like there's, there are some issues there that, that maybe we're, we're kind of tucking away. We're burying them deep. In fact, whenever we do a series on this, we, we do a little survey. We ask some of you, some of your thoughts about relationships. And one person said, this is how we handle conflict. I shut down, he shuts down. We don't resolve anything. So some of us can relate to that. It just gets buried like a bomb that is a few feet below the surface, hasn't detonated yet. So things seem fine. But if anyone ever digs that thing up, And it goes off, look for the mushroom cloud over our house, right? It's like, it's going to be big. It's, it's unresolved conflict. And then others of us might be going, hey, conflict is healthy. It's good. Like we fight hard. We love hard. Yeah. That's our relationship. And I don't totally disagree. There is such a thing as healthy conflict. We'll talk about that during the series, how to have healthy conflict. But for a lot of us, it can start healthy. Like we need to talk. And then nine minutes into the talk, it starts to go south and a verbal jab gets thrown over here and there's some sparring over there and an uppercut over here in the, the things we're saying to each other and the attitude that's starting to rise up in us. And there's this conflict where we find ourselves on two different pages. One person said, my approach to conflict is to talk about it calmly. His is to go in for the kill. And some of us can relate to that. Like there's, uh, there's tension. It's not hiding, it's not buried. There's no bomb a few feet below the surface, just a lot of hand grenades being tossed on a regular basis. And that's, that's, that's where we find ourselves. And then others of us right now are going, hey, you've only been talking about conflict in relationships for four minutes and I'm already tired. Because <laughs> I've just had so much of it. And I've tried everything and I've, I'm, I've given up on things ever changing. I tried to avoid the conflict. I tried to be reasonable, reasonable about the conflict. I tried to engage the conflict in a healthy way. I've tried it all and nothing seems to get better or if it gets better, it doesn't stay better. And I'm just not sure there's anything you could say that would, that would make this different for me. But what if, just what if it doesn't have to be that way? What if it doesn't have to stay that way? Any of those ways. So remember the question, why is there so much conflict in our relationships? If we have that question or have had that question at any point in our lives, we're not alone. In fact, people have been asking it for a long time. A guy in the Bible named James asks this very same question. Here's how he says it. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? So notice he doesn't say, are there any? <laughs> he says, I'm gonna assume there are. So the question is, what's causing them? That's the question. Where's the hostility and the bickering and the sniping and the sarcasm and the friction and the resentment and the silent treatment and the passive aggressive comments? Where is all of that coming from, especially between two people who started out with nothing but hearts for eyes emojis toward each other? Like, I love you. You complete me. How did that become this? But what's causing all that. Wouldn't you like to know? I, mean, I would. I, I feel like if we knew, then our relationships could have a fighting chance of getting better. So Super Bowl Sunday, which means today, uh, two teams who have worked hard, fought hard, played hard all season, trained hard, got ready for the big day. And here they are. I can't believe it. They made it. And they're going to face off against each other in this seismic conflict, the Super Bowl. And they're going to clash. They're going to 
They're gonna fight, they're gonna scrape, they're gonna scratch, they're gonna bleed, they're gonna tackle, they're gonna scream. I mean, they're just gonna go hard trying to get the most points and there can be no tie. Like there's gonna be a winner. Somebody's gonna be the winner, somebody's gonna be the loser. In the midst of it all, 723 billion bags of Tostitos will be consumed, 223 billion gallons of salsa. By halftime, people won't even be dipping their chips. They'll just be taking the salsa straight up. Like it is, it's gonna be the Super Bowl. For three and a half hours, these two teams will go at it and millions of us will watch all over the world. Three and a half hours, punctuated only by a few timeouts and some mediocre commercials and a halftime show during which someone is absolutely guaranteed to wear something that will make your grandma blush. It's the Super Bowl. <laughs> it's gonna be this intense conflict. Two different teams. Ah! It's your marriage. I mean, it's a Super Bowl. It's... And the, and the only difference is between that and many of our close relationships is that it won't take those two quarterbacks nearly as long to hug and make up afterward as it will many of us. Uh, we'll wake up the next morning and the game will still be on. <laughs> you might've won yesterday, but. <laughs> well, the question is why? Why do, why do our relationships get like that? Where, where does that come from? And we have theories, right? All of us right now, you have been forming, you have an answer to that question. You're not, you're not going, I don't know. You know. Some of you are going, it's them. It's the person I'm dating. If you, if you met them, it's the person I'm married to. It's my ex. If you met them, you would pray and dismiss. You would know you didn't even need a sermon. Like you'd go, oh, because it's them. That's where the fighting comes from. It's them. Others of us would say it's our circumstances. It's the season we're in right now. It's, a little, it's very stressful. That's why we're fighting a lot. We're not getting along. In fact, when we ask you what's the number one source of conflict in your relationships, overwhelmingly you said money. We fight over money. It's, I'm a saver, she's a spender. We just, we fight over that. And if that's you, we just finished a series on money called The Hustle. I highly recommend that you sit on the couch, get it on the screen, watch it, holding hands. <laughs> As we talk about how to get free from the, the money trap and live a different way. So some of us would go, and if it's not money, it's something else in our circumstances. That's our theory. We're fighting because it's a stressful season. And then others of us might say, it's our kids. We were fine until they came along. They're needy and they're, they're an issue. Like it's, in fact, or we would say it's our in-laws. It's, it's, their, it's their parents. It's my stepkids. It's the blended family. That's the thing. It's other people. One person said the, the only time we have a major fight is when we're around our families. And these were anonymous, so I couldn't respond, but I wanted to on this one. I wanted to respond and say, move away. <laughs> like how far? Start with a continent. <laughs> so is it all that stuff? Is it, is it the person we're in a relationship with? Like we, just, we chose the wrong person. Is it circumstances, money, seasonal things, issues from outside? Is it other people, our kids, our extended family, is it all that stuff? And certainly those pressures are very real. I don't want to diminish them in any way, but is it possible there's something else going on? And if you're not sure what you think about God and the Bible yet, if you're, if you're skeptical, then you're, you're probably not going to buy this next part. But James says, hey, where, where are all the quarrels and fights coming from? And then he says this, don't they come from the evil desires that war within you? Um, no, James, they might come from the evil desires in my wife. She's pretty evil. <laughs> my ex, their license plate is EV1L, like they're, they're pretty evil. Um, could be our kids. I'm pretty sure they're possessed, James. Uh, <laughs> 
probably his parents. I feel like they meet that standard. But it's, or maybe it's the evil desires at war in our checking account right now. There is a battle there for sure. Uh, But it's not, it's not me, James. I don't have, what are you, what are evil desires? Like, I don't have evil desires. I'm not perfect, I got, you know, but I'm, are you saying I'm selfish? Are you, are you saying I have, like, part of the issue is me? Can't be me. James says, listen, all that other stuff, and there's a lot in James, by the way, about those external pressures and how to navigate them. But he says, while all of that may be real, none of it is actually causing our worst conflicts. We are. That's a lot to take in. And again, it doesn't help that James refers to this as our evil desires. That's kind of like a, puts us off a little bit. Like, James, slow down, man. But he says that before the other person ever let us down, like before the disagreement, before the argument or the disrespect or the nagging ever began, before the stress arrived or the layoff occurred or the trash wasn't taken out or the dishes weren't done or the baby woke up in the middle of the night or we found that text, before any of that ever happened, there were already selfish forces at work in us that had set us up in advance to react, to retaliate, or to resent. We were already destined to have a fight because of stuff happening in us. Like even if we had married the perfect person, it was inevitable. So the question is why? I mean, okay, even if we acknowledge we have some stuff in us, why would we give into it? I mean, why would two people who love each other more than anything end up getting involved in unhealthy conflict? Why would we ever do that? In fact, you probably had moments or seasons in your relationship where you thought you were determined, not today, we're gonna get along today. You ever, have, you ever made that decision? Like, I'm gonna be patient today, I'm gonna be kind, I'm gonna be forgiving. If you're a Christian, you're like, I'm gonna be so much like the Lord. He's gonna be like, whoa, twinning. Like, I, today, <laughs> today's the day, this week, there will be peace in our home. And then 28 minutes later, Like one text, one grouchy remark, and it's like, why would we do that? James knew he would ask, you want what you don't have. Oh. So there it is. Where do the quarrels and fights and ongoing tension, where's all that come from in our relationships? We want what we don't have. As I thought about that, I thought, well, what are some of the things we want? And I made just a very short list. Respect, love, affirmation, peace, happiness, space, intimacy, consideration, understanding, protection, devotion, loyalty, forgiveness, faithfulness. Let me pause. (laughs) That's what we want. And And we could go on, right? And when we don't get those things from the person who in our minds is most responsible to give it to us, We fight for it. We we come out swinging. And most of the time, we are not fighting for what's right. We're really just fighting for what's right for us. You say, well, why is that even a big deal? I mean, why does it matter? Because eventually what happens is as we continue to want what we don't have and become frustrated with the other person because they're not giving it to us, The next thing that happens is, so you scheme and kill to get it. Now, hopefully not literally, this is not a lifetime movie. (laughs) But we, we kill the relationship. So we scheme and we kill to get what we want but don't have. So let me ask you a question. How many of us growing up as a kid, adolescent, had a pet? How many of us had like a pet? You remember your first pet? So it might have been a dog or a cat or a parakeet or a gerbil or... A lemming, I don't know, you know. Uh, 
Might've been a fish, yeah, goldfish, something like that. Remember your first pet? So I remember my first pet. My first pet was a peeve. <laughs> I know, right? Dad jokes. <laughs> Wes Wilmington, I'll give you a minute to compose yourselves. <laughs> I know you're laughing uproariously there. But... No, really, my, my first pet was a peeve. I bet yours was too. Now, it wasn't your pet peeve when it first showed up. It was just some random peeve. You don't even know where it came from. You can't even remember when. It became your, like you can't remember when you couldn't stand socks being left on the floor. Like when did that happen? When did it cause you, when did you start losing your mind if the dishes were on the counter instead of in the sink or better yet in the dishwasher? When, when, when was it life or death that she didn't respond to your text in a time sensitive manner? Like you don't even know. You're like when did, I don't even know but it was just a peeve and then you let it in and you started feeding it and you maybe even built a little house to keep it safe and warm and, and you fed it and you, and you named it and you taught it to do tricks, roll over, oh, good job. And it's your, it's your pet peeve. And then you brought it into your closest relationships with you. You brought it into your marriage, brought it into your parenting, brought it into your dating. Some of us brought a whole pack of peeves. Like we got so many peeves, they're running around. We're like, I don't even, what's your name, peeve? Like, where'd I get all these? I got all, all these pet peeves. And <laughs> if you only come this week, it will not help you. You have to come back for the rest of the series. <laughs> Your life will get worse if you just. <laughs> you got to come back. Uh, but we, we have all these preferences. And they start to just become part of us. And we can't even imagine so when they get violated, we're like, ah. Have you, ever, have you ever stopped to think what a bystander, an objective bystander would think if they watched you fight with the person you're really close with? Like, what are you fighting about? Socks? What? <laughs> it's a pet peeve. And as a result of that, we can't fight fair. In fact, we asked you, uh, do you fight fair? And one of you said, I believe I fight fair. Maybe I should ask my husband, LOL. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Might want to get a second opinion. James says most of us don't. We don't fight fair. Instead, we scheme and we kill. We sch- and some of us are going, man, I don't scheme. Like James, these are strong words. I don't scheme. But we do, right? We scheme in our heads. Just wait until he gets home. I'm gonna let him know, like tonight's the night. I'm gonna let him know. And if he's late, that's a good thing because I can pile that on top because that's another pet. Here, boy, like that's that's another pet peeve. I can just, we're gonna get him tonight. Hey, baby, hey. (laughs) Or, how do I word this text to her with the optimal amount of sarcasm, but it's defensible if I get called out on it? I didn't mean that. You're too sensitive. <laughs> Scheming. <laughs> or you know what? Someone's going, oh, I won't even give them the pleasure of a reaction. It's about to get cold in this house. Fortress. I won't even act like it bothers me. Or, you know what? I'm going to be overly cheerful just to annoy them. Scheming, scheming. Hey. We scheme. And eventually we kill the relationship. Kill the hope. We kill each other's spirits. Uh, We kill our own peace and our own joy. All because, watch this now, we want what we don't have. And gets even worse. Ready? Promise it's going to get better. You got to come back. But first it gets worse. You are jealous of what others have. But you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Anybody, honestly, just be honest, kind of done with James for now? (laughs) 
Like, is there another book of the Bible we could talk about? So I have a problem. Some of you may be able to relate to this. I like to work. Now, on its own, that's not a problem. That's a good thing. But when I say I like to work, I mean that I have a history of overworking and obsessing about my work and being very anxious about it and very driven around it. And I'm growing. It's, that's how I used to be. By God's grace, a lot of good people in my life. I'm changing and learning how to live life differently. But for many years in our marriage, uh, I put work first. In fact, I chose work and then I tried to fit Susie in around it. And even our kids when they were little. It's hard to admit, but I kind of tried to fit them in around it. And I thought, especially when we were first starting the church, I thought I needed to answer every email right away, every text, take every call, fix every problem. I just couldn't stop working. I was obsessed with it, just driven, anxious about it. And it caused a lot of pain in our marriage. Susie, on the other hand, now she's a very hard worker in many ways. In fact, I've, I've come to learn that there are some things she works harder on than I do. But she knows how to rest. And she knows how to enjoy rest. And there were many years in our marriage, or many times when she would be resting, and I would get mad inside. And I'd be frustrated with her. And I would, I would think to myself, why doesn't she act more like I act? You ever think that way? I would, you ever think, I would like you more if you were more like me. If you could just be more like me, because I'm so awesome. In this area, you got a lot to learn. I could teach you. <laughs> I know none of you have ever had these thoughts, but and I would think, why doesn't she work as hard as I work? What's, what's wrong with her? Doesn't she know how many things need to get done? Look, she's there, she's resting and there's so much that needs to be done. And I would make passive aggressive comments sometimes, or I'd walk around in a huff, you know, just kind of make a lot of noise while I was cleaning up. Like, and then there were even times when I would try to manipulate her with motivational statements. Like the early bird gets the worm. <laughs> and one day, I'll never forget this. One day Susie looked at me in the middle of some of this dysfunctional behavior. And she said, I think I know what your problem is, which is a terrible way to start a conversation. <laughs> I said, oh yeah, what's that? She said, you're, I think you're jealous because I know how to rest and you don't. And I was like, no. <laughs> Except she was right. Deep down what I wanted, you'd have never picked up on this from the outside, but deep down what I wanted so badly was permission to stop working and worrying about work and just for one hour or just one Saturday morning not be fast forwarding into everything else I needed to do but just rest, she had rest, I didn't, I couldn't get it, so I fought and I waged war in our marriage to take it away from her. And if you'd have told me that's what I was doing, I would have told you you were crazy, but that's exactly what I was doing, why? Because we want what we don't have, and here's the problem, the other person can't give it to us. But we're convinced they can. And so we keep going to them going, it's not fair. You have it. And I don't, and I don't know what it is for you. Is it their cheerful attitude? Is it their sense of steadiness and calm? Is it, is it how many friends they have at work? What is it that you're just like, I, you don't even know, but deep down you want what they have. And so instead of just acknowledging that, we decide that they shouldn't have it either. So we fight and we wage war. Okay, you ready for some good news? I hope so. You're like, come on, man. Here it is. Thankfully, there's really good news. We can stop the crazy cycle. We don't have to stay there. And we don't even have to wait for the other person in the relationship to change. There is a different path. We can reduce the unhealthy fighting in our relationships. We can drop our pet peeves off at the peeve shelter put them up for adoption, let somebody else take care of them. We can, we can find a new path forward and we're going to see it during this series. That there actually is a way for things to change, for us to change. And we're gonna talk about it next week. We're gonna talk about how to rebuild trust in our lives. 
and how to aim it at the right source, even if, a, if another person or people have let us down, how to rebuild trust and rebuild security in our lives. And it applies to all of us, whether we're in a romantic relationship or not. Week three, I can't, I can't wait to tell you the number one thing I've learned about marriage in 22 years. It's a simple change to our approach that I'm not exaggerating, I'm not being overly dramatic, can change everything. And then week four, we're gonna look at what it means to love somebody and to be loved by somebody. It's not what we think and how to keep faith, hope, and love alive in our lives even when it seems to have died in a relationship. But we gotta start with the problem. So week one is the heavy lifting and then we're gonna get to hope we got to start here. The problem is we want what we don't have and the other person can't give it to us. So I'm going to encourage you during this series to take some, some next steps starting this week. Here's the first one, very simple. Make a decision to come back next weekend. Maybe you're new here and you're just checking it out or maybe you are feeling like I'm not so sure this is for me. I've tried a lot of things and it's got too many hurts and too much stuff going on, baggage in my life, I just don't know. Give it four hours this month, one every week. Just come back, you already have the first one almost down. And just see what God could do in your life, in this area. The second next step is I wanna encourage all of us, wherever you are spiritually, to get connected in a J group. And here's why. Sometimes our closest relationships begin to suffocate because we're not getting enough steady oxygen from some other healthy sources. And when we have a few people in our lives, not romantic relationships, but friendships with people going the same direction we are, focused on faith, then they can breathe life and strength into us to help us, not as a replacement for those close relationships that are maybe struggling, but to give us the strength to go back in and to go about it in a healthy way. And then the third next step I wanna encourage you to take is if you're not yet, start serving on the J team. And if you've been serving in the past and maybe you've drifted away, re-engage and I'll tell you why. I can't think of any habit that better prepares and trains our hearts and our heads and our hands for healthy relationships than to have a simple, commitment to doing something for others that we don't get paid for and for which we expect nothing in return because that's how the best relationships flourish. And if you'll get this, we have a J team, a, a team of people serving, there are about 700 of you now and there's lots of space and lots of room and the reason this team exists is not to get stuff done, it's to get us transformed because as we give our lives away like Jesus in simple ways, an hour or two a week, as we give our lives away like Jesus, we become more like Jesus and we go back into our relationships and our pet peeves lose their hold on us. And we begin to live differently. So I'm encouraging you to take these steps. Come back, connect in a group, start serving or re-engage in serving on the J team. Take the next step in the growth track and further your spiritual growth because God wants to do a work in your life. And for week one, it starts here. This is where many of our conflicts and our fights come from in our relationships. So our, our obvious ones and our subtle ones, our yelling ones and our silent treatment ones, our clashing ones and our drifting away ones. Here's where they come from. We want what we don't have. And the other person can't give it to us, but someone can. There is someone who knows what we want sees what we need. And not only that, he is able to give it to us. And even when he doesn't give us what we think we want, what he does instead is begin to transform what we want so it better aligns with his best for us. And then he gives us what we really want, what we crave more than anything. And here's a sneak peek at who this someone is. James says, here's the problem. You don't have what you want. And here's the reason, you've been going to the wrong source. You don't ask God for it. You're asking somebody 
to do things in you and for you that no one on this planet can do in and for you except God. See, here's what's true about me. Here's what's true about you. Here's what's true about all of us. You want what you don't have. That's the problem, all of us do. He or she, that other person in your life, can't give it to you. So what, they would just try harder. They don't have the capacity, ongoingly, to fulfill you. God can. God can. And during this series, we're gonna see how he does and how he wants to. And we're gonna get very practical. But basically what James is saying is we've been looking for love in all the wrong places, everybody. And ultimately we've been looking for everything we need in the wrong places. Remember our list, respect, love, affirmation, peace, happiness, space, intimacy, consideration, understanding, protection, devotion, loyalty, forgiveness, faithfulness, all only come fully from our God. And so during this series, we're gonna see how to get what we really need without all the fight. And in the process, I think some of us are gonna figure out how to begin fighting for some of our relationships. Instead of fighting against the other person, how to fight for some relationships that maybe the enemy has said it's always gonna be this way or it's never gonna work out or I guess you just weren't meant to be happy. And God says, I have a different opinion if you'll ask me. And so if you would say that week one, if you would say, hey, I'm gonna make that simple commitment. I'm coming back, I'm leaning in. I want God to do a work in my life during this series. Will you just shoot your hand up all over the room? Hold it up high. I wanna pray for us. God would give us the grace to experience him during this series. Father, we come to you, our great and awesome God. We can already feel some of the pressure lifting off of us, some of the tension evaporating as we begin to realize, oh, I've been going to the wrong source. Only you can complete us, only you can fill us up, only you can make us whole. And other people certainly give us a taste of that, give us a peek at that, give us a glimpse of that, but only you ultimately can give us what we need. So we pray, God, that you'll help us come to you and ask you and receive from you these next few weeks. In Jesus' name, amen. All around you right now, there are people who came to a moment in their lives, listen very closely to this, so important came to a moment in their lives when they realized that they weren't going to find what they really need in another person or in a career or a degree or a net worth or even in themselves and their own plans. And so they gave their lives over to God. And the way they gave their lives to God was not by joining a religion or being holy enough or doing a lot of good works. They gave themselves over to God by putting their faith, their trust in Jesus Christ his son, the one who came and died for us and rose again from the dead. This is the message of Jesus. If you wanna know what, what Christianity, what faith is really all about, it's about Jesus. He came and gave his life for us so that all of us who believe in him wouldn't be separated from God, but would have a real relationship with God, would have eternal life, life forever, completely secure. And maybe you're not ready to take that step yet. If so, that's okay. I'm not gonna pressure you into it by any stretch. But if you are ready, if God's drawing you to him, I wanna give you the opportunity right now to take that step to begin a real relationship with God. So I want everyone to join me. We're gonna pray one more time. Everybody just open your heart up big to God. And then if that's you today at RCA, in West Wilmington here in Newark. If you need to begin a real relationship with Jesus Christ, right where you are, whisper out a prayer of faith. Jesus, today I believe in you. I place all my confidence in you and you alone. You died to forgive my sins. I surrender my life. I'm gonna follow you. 
And if that's you, if you would say, I wanna be included in that, I want you to lift a hand and just hold it up high, boldly, you're declaring, my faith is in Jesus. My trust is in him today. And then everybody, I want you to help me put those hands together. Let's give our God thanks and praise. Thank you, guys.